Okay, so we've backed up the system to ensure that any stripping um, was, uh, you know, if it failed, that we had a backup to restore from. Um, it turned out to luckily to be successful. Uh, now we're going into system administration, uh, sorry, the configuration, which is basically all about providing some basic configurations such as host name, network setup, and so on. Um, so just a few configuration files we need to uh, deal with here, just set up. Um, you know, th these sort of configurations, they're quite basic, but um, it's important to get them right because um, otherwise the computer is likely not to respond properly or worse, it will uh, fail to boot up correctly. So let's um, get on with this. So section nine. So it is a little bit here about the history of system V. Um, so that's that there. It gives the advantages and disadvantages. Um, it's definitely simpler, so there's got to be an advantage, especially when we're trying to learn about Linux. It makes things easier to understand. So boot scripts, so these are the scripts that run at boot time where you normally see like some service starting and then it says OK on the right. You sometimes see that. So all we need to do, these have all been made for us by the LFS team. So what we need to do is extract it, change into the directory and as you can see we just type in make install and that's it. These scripts are listed in the book if you want to examine them closely or you can obviously examine them on the system. So next there's a bit about device and module handling and originally these modules were static, um, static nodes um, but recently, well the last 10-20 years or so, um, there are programs which go around the system trying to identify um, hardware and um, creates devices automatically um, and these devices are obviously um, virtual devices to gain access to the hardware devices themselves. So some history about how it works, um, won't go into that But that's something that's certainly worth reading. Then there's something about network devices. Um, they've changed. They used to be just referred to as something like ETH0, ETH1 and so on for each Ethernet device. But what could happen was that that designation may change each boot up. So there's something called persistent naming where the device, the network device, gets a name that reflects its physical um, appearance or location on the hardware bus. So it might be a simple thing such as net zero or it might be something such as you know net zero n1 p q uh, two you know it could be some complicated thing depending on how it's connected internally in the machine the name as I say given to it is um, reflects that so it does make it unique because it's unique because it's physically in a certain uh, like electrical location on the bus then by giving it a name that reflects that it can only be unique because it can only be one uh, bit of hardware existing at that location so um, they're a little bit more complicated to use because they tend to be a bunch of numbers and letters but once you understand how to interpret them they're they're not too bad um, If you've only got one Ethernet device, then it's probably not a problem. Um, but they are better to use, I, th I think, myself. I, I use them. So creating custom UDEV rules. and The naming scheme can be customized by creating UDEV rules. So there's a script for this. 
already on the system that's obviously been installed previously as we've gone through. You can run it like that and you can examine one of those files to find out what the name of the net network device actually is. And you can see on this system, it is actually a simple one, EN01. So that's a letter O and a digit one. As I say, some others, they'll all start, always start EN for Ethernet. Um, wireless start with WN, I think it is. Um, and then there might be an, like an S0, N1 or something after that on Sun systems. Um, but others such as this one do have more simpler names. And it's also shown us what device it is. So that's worth remembering for when we come to uh, deal with the kernel. Um, that's the actual kernel module that's used for the network device. So I'm going to make a quick note of that because that will definitely be useful. But I'll show you how else we can try and identify that when we come to it. So I'm just making a handwritten note about that. And we've got uh, a network, I'll make a note of that, save me to refer it, ENO, digit one. CD-ROMs, potentially the same problem there if you've still got system CD-ROMs. Again, if you've got CD-ROMs with um, more than, a uh, system with more than one CD-ROM, that could possibly, in theory, uh, each CD-ROM get designated a different uh, name each time it boots up so uh, there's ways of controlling that here um, if you read this through um, if you wish to see the values that the dev scripts will use then for the appropriate cd-rom device find the corresponding directory under sys and run a command similar to the following so we can try this this machine has actually got a cd-rom in it it came with a cd-rom um, Unable to load it, so maybe we'd have to look at sys block, see what devices are there. Okay, is HTD? I wonder if that's the old uh, device names before um, the SCSI layer in the kernel was used for SATA drive, so it's probably like the old parallel IDE designation. But you can see we've got SDA, which is the hard disk, SDA, which is the USB I've booted from, and SR0 is the um, CD-ROM. So let's see if we replace SR0. In fact, yes, that's come back with a load of information. Um, yeah, there's quite a lot of information come back about that. Uh, that looks like the capabilities of the CD-ROM drive. Okay, so um, let's just carry on. It says here how to modify it if uh, the default mode is not suitable. Dealing with duplicate devices, again, video cards, you may have more than one video card, so it tells you how to deal with that as well. So general network configuration, um, when it, which interfaces are brought up and down by network script usually depends on the files in etc sysconfig, and that directory should contain a file for each interface to be, conf to be configured. So what we've got here is a, a default setup for the network. So what I'm going to do to start off with is to copy and paste that in, and then I'm going to have to modify it um, as appropriate to um, uh, ensure that the network card is configured correctly. So this won't. This isn't the actual driver 
for the network card. This is just the configuration um, which tells the Linux system how to gain access to the network by using the hardware. So let's have a look at that file. The first thing I'm going to change is if you read here, it says that the file name is ifconfig.xyz, where xyz should describe the network card. So it's got ETH0. I'm not using that format. I'm using the actual uh, designation that you devs given by uh, probing the hardware. So what I'm going to do is to rename that ifconfig to ifconfig and the name of the network card that I got earlier on, which was en01. So that means that that script will only pertain to the network card that's built into this machine. And if I had to, then obviously I'd create another one with the correct designation for that network card. So now I'm going to edit this file to change the details to um, reflect uh, how it should connect. So again, the interface name is wrong. I need to type in ENO1. Services uh, static IP for IP version four, and the IP I'm going to give it. You'd have to find out from your router what IP range you could allocate manually. Um, mine, I've got anything under uh, zero, and I tend to use anything over two hundred for um, ad hoc IP addresses. So this two hundred should do. The gateway I've got, again, you'd have to consult your router to see what the gateway would be in this system. It's that, 192.168.0.1. And because of that, this also needs to be changed to 192.168.0.255 for the broadcast. But apart from that, that should be all that's required. And there's some more information about how to set it up, as, I, as I've just done. The next thing that needs setting up is the resolve.conf. This is the um, way that the uh, Linux system will obtain uh, name resolution with uh, IP addresses and vice versa. So again, I'm going to copy this in to the terminal and then edit it by hand to modify it, it's probably the easiest way to deal with this. Now the domain, you don't need this if you haven't got a domain. Um, I have, so I shall use that. And my domain is mynet.org. The name server, this is the IP address of your, well the first one is the primary network server. So I have my own name server. So I'm gonna put that in. Um, you can look online for free name servers or just copy the one that your router uses or two of them. It may have two, it could even have three. Um, just keep adding them in the same order that they are on your router. So I don't use any other because that DNS will resolve to use other name servers the way I've configured it. But normally you would add in another name server as a backup. So I'll save that. Now we configure the host name, so I'll copy this in here, and we also need to replace the information within the double quotes with something meaningful. So what shall I give this? Let's be adventurous and give it something like LFS 11-2. I don't think you can use full stops in the name, but you can use dashes. Um, I don't think you can use spaces either. So that's the host name. So that will be the canonical name that the machine has. Then there's the hosts file. This is the one where you can specify your own IP to name server allocations. So again, I've copied and pasted the um, uh, configuration that's in the book. And then I'm going to go back 
and edit it by hand. So VI ETC hosts. And what I shall do is a lot of these you don't really need. Um, things like this is not really necessary. You can put it in. A, a, I vaguely remember reading about this once, and it's to do with certain uh, systems that. Uh, I can't remember the details now. They don't quite do things normally. Um, so maybe if you find something's not working right, maybe you could try actually putting this in, but I found it's unnecessary. It's not required. Uh, this one I will need. Sorry, the top one is for the local host. So that defines that, uh, if I put some tabs in here, So this is the loopback address, loopback IP address, and then that tells it that the loopback address is the local host at the local name. That's the fully qualified domain name, and the short form of the loopback address is is local host. Then we've got a line which defines the IP address that we're using. So this has to be the same as the one we set before in the network adapter configuration that's the ifconfig.en01 so i'll put 200 in there again the fully qualified domain name so that'll be again the same name as the host that i just set so that was lfs11-2 then followed that by follow that with a full stop my with your domain name so if you haven't got domain name that doesn't matter, just leave just leave it off. Mynet.org. So if you haven't got the domain name, that would just read LFS11-2. And then you can add in any other aliases that you wish to. If you are using a domain, then you need to just repeat the host name here. So LFS11-2. And any other aliases you wish to know, have the box known by. So it could be called, you know, PC. 12 or something like that if you want to wish to refer to it by another name otherwise just delete these aliases here and again i'm not using ipv6 don't use it at all so i'm just going to get rid of these lines here and that should be all that's required for that file there now we go into the system v boot, script, usage and configuration. And there's some information there about it, about how this works to boot up the terminal or a graphical environment. Well, we haven't got a graphical environment because we haven't built one yet. That would be something to do in Beyond Linux from scratch. So at the moment, we'll just copy and paste this uh, for a default init tab. And some information there about starting and stopping boot scripts, about UDEV boot scripts. So I'll, again, I'll leave you to read this yourself in your own time. Then we've got a bit about configuring the system clock. So this is quite important if you want to ensure that the correct time is set every time you boot up. And there's not a lot to do here really, apart from knowing how you're going to be using the machine. Now, if you are dual booting this machine with a Windows machine, then you need to set this UTC value to zero. And that tells the system clock that you're using local time because that's what Windows uses. Um, however, if you're not booting Windows and this is a standalone setup or you're booting with other Linuxes, then you can leave it at one and that tells the um, Linux system, the LFS system, that the time is stored in UTC time and that uh, all the programs within Linux will calculate the correct offset for your region. So because this is a single system, we, if you remember we overwrote Windows, I'm just going to leave that as UTC1 so that the clock stores the time um, as UTC or what used to be known as GMT, Greenwich Mean Time. But as I say, if you're dual booting with Windows, you need to set that to zero so that the time is stored in local time. 
and not in UTC time zone. And it says it this parameter can also be set in this file here. So now we're going to configure the Linux console. This sets up a few parameters and you can see there's the um, possible uh, parameters can be set there. They've given us a default uh, or a few defaults that you might want to use or crib from. Um, so what I'm going to do is to look for one that looks similar enough to what I want to use. Um, looks like they've probably listed most of these that are perhaps more weirder setups if you like. So what I'll do is I'll copy this first one which looks like it's for a Polish setup. Well I'm not Polish, I'm not in a Polish location so I do need to modify this. So modify the file now. I've copied and pasted it in. So the key, pa key map for me that I'll be using is simple and it's UK for United Kingdom. And the font I'll be using is lat2-16. And the ISO code is dash 1 for Western Europe, I believe that is. I think the dash 2 is for Eastern Europe. So that's all I need um, for UK. Um, one other thing I will add in is an extra entry here called log level. And if you read the information here it tells you it's for setting the kernel messages the default 7 you'll get loads of kernel messages appearing on the console every now and then and it can be quite annoying they're just informational really so what i do here is type in log level equals 3 and i, I can't remember the exact level but i think it's uh, severe or fatal errors i can't remember the exact wording but 3 means that you'll only see important messages appearing on the screen really important messages from the kernel rather than just information messages. So that should be sufficient. Um, if you want to know other parameters that can be set, um, does it say here? Yeah, there's a how to there. It tells you how to modify them, probably other keyboard key maps as well. Um, yeah, decide which key map and screen font be used. So you can set a screen font here as well. Um, so that link will tell you how to do that. Um, there's some information about creating files at boot, configuring the syskalog D script. The rc.site file, it lists it here um, and it's in bold as if you need to type it in, but you don't need to. There's nothing to do with this. It's just here for information. Um, so if I was to display that, uh, let's do less. You'll see the top of that is identical to what's here. I don't know why they've put this in bold um, because there aren't any changes here. You can see they've got the log, log level there for the console logging. And as it says, the default is noisy. And that's why I've set it myself. Um, to level 3 and if we go down the bottom you can see it's just identical there's no changes there um, you don't need to add, add it to the system it's already there so, so I think that's probably a bug with the book that shouldn't be in, in bold and there's some more information there about some of the settings you may want to change So now we go into the bash startup files and if we look at this we need to set up the correct locale, uh, locale. Well obviously we've got all these locales because we added them all to do all the testing. Um, if you hadn't added them all it would just have the ones that you've added. So the ones that I would have added had I not done all this testing would have been these two. Uh, Get a hold of these two here um, and what we need to do is to well you can type this command in here 
to get information about that particular locale. So the one I tend to use is this one here. And you can see it tells me the char map. That's the name of the char map. So it's all in capitals. And as you can see, there are other options to list up there. So we can ask for the language for that locale. And it says it's British English. Uh, char map we've done. International currency symbol. The Great Britain pound and the international prefix this is the phone prefix for international dialing is 44 so we need this information to create the next file which is the etc profile and what that asks us for is the language so it needs the language and region and then the char map so for ENGB, it will be EN underscore GB, and then the char map which we got, which was this bit here. So, what I shall do is edit that file to modify it. Sorry, it's a profile, isn't it? And I've already copied this bit. Let's do it again without the full stop. And I need to replace this first part. So the EN is the LL part and the GB in capitals is the CC part. So I'll insert there and paste in that bit. I'll save that and go back and copy the char map that I was given. Go back in to edit and replace the char map, char map with what was told. Modifiers, there are no modifiers, but it does suggest that maybe... Um, I think you can add in something there to get the euro symbol, as, as I remember, or maybe other modifiers. Uh, but for me, that's sufficient. Obviously, wherever your location is, you'll need to modify that as appropriate. So next, we go to the input RC file. So this is just a... Um, configuration for the input method which is normally the keyboard and I normally add in a couple of other things here just out of personal preference which I'll share uh, sorry input RC this one isn't it input. so we've got stuff to change how the buttons work on the keyboard to extend what the keyboard does and what I do here is to add in um, some uh, well really bash settings actually to extend I think most of them are bash settings extend how um, bash completes and so on so the first one is to set visible stats on and what this does is when you do a listing uh, an extended listing so an ls minus l for example it will show a star for an executable file a forward slash for a directory and an at sign for a link so that could be what quite useful the next one i've got is um, set show all if ambiguous and I'll turn that on and what that does it displays all matches if there are more of one after a single tab um, so at the moment I have to press tab twice to get any matches for the autocomplete but this will display the matches after just one tab so it can make things a little bit easier if you're trying to autocomplete and there are various options and the autocomplete can't can't complete because there's several options. It doesn't know which one you want. Um, another one that can be useful, useful, sometimes it can be a bit annoying, but it's to set completion ignore case 
on and what this does it will auto complete and ignore the case so if I was to start typing command in uppercase it would attempt to complete it the name of that command in both uppercase or lowercase it will try and match one or the other um, and then another one is set print completions horizontally off so I believe the default uh, way of showing completions or partial completions is to list the completions horizontally which um, I'd rather have done vertically so by setting that it um, shows the completions in tab in column format so they'll be listed in the first column then down the second column and down the third column and so on rather than across the columns reading across the lines so again that that's just a preference um, so if I was to do something like LSC yeah it's um, working just after one um, let's do LS minus L Oh no, it's not actually working yet. So it's probably because it's going to be, it will be used at, at startup. So we'll see that when we boot in um, at the first boot of the system. So that's the input RC file. Next one we've got is etc shells. And this file is simple. It just displays or tells the system what shells we have on the system that are available. So bin bash is the only shell we've got, but we have got a sim link to bin sh because bin sh is a generic uh, link that will point to a shell um, that scripts can use. 